Hello, I'm Ralph Gable of the Electronics for the Inquisitive Experimenter YouTube channel. You know, I was having a conversation with a friend of mine the other day, and the whole topic of reactants and impedance and phasers came up. It was clear from this conversation that I needed to create a video on the topic to help dispel some of the mystery around all of this stuff. In this video, I'm going to talk about the basics of capacitive and inductive reactants and pure resistance. I'm going to show how to plot them on a Cartesian coordinate plane as well as series and parallel impedances. I've provided a link in the description which has all of this math for you. Feel free to download it if you're interested in it. If you have questions or comments, please feel free to add a comment to this video. If you find this video helpful, please click on the like and don't forget to subscribe. Let's begin, as always, with laying some foundations. One of the very basic things that we have to be aware of is the totally impossible but inescapable entity in this whole business. And that is the square root of minus one. In the math world, this is represented by the lowercase i, but because electronics world already assigned i to current, we use the letter j to represent the square root of minus one. Well, what makes this totally impossible? Well, mathematically speaking, if I take any number and multiply it by itself, the result is always a positive number. So one times one is a positive one, but then again, minus one times minus one is also a plus one. 2 times 2 is a positive 4, but minus 2 times minus 2 is still a positive 4. The operation of the square root is asking the question, what number when multiplied by itself is the number in question? So the square root of 4 is asking the question, what number when multiplied by itself is 4? And there are two answers to this. Minus 2, because minus 2 times minus 2 is equal to 4, a positive 4. But then again, plus 2 times plus 2 is also equal to 4. If any number, when multiplied by itself, is always positive, then there is no number, when multiplied by itself, is a minus 1. It is a mathematically impossible number. And this is why it is often referred to as an imaginary number because, well, it can't exist, and yet it does. So what makes it an inescapable number? Well, when the high up math muckety-muck folks do all the complex calculations and formulas with electronics and physics and all this stuff, well, there it is. This impossible number infects many, many areas of physics, not just electronics. Furthermore, its necessity is proven by the very fact that, well, it works. There is one very important property of this impossible, inescapable number that I must mention before I continue. If two is the square root of four, then 2 squared, or 2 multiplied by itself, is 4. And if j is equal to the square root of minus 1, then j squared is equal to j times j, j multiplied by itself, that must equal minus 1. And you'll see why this is important in just a little while. Now, how does all this relate to our subject? Now we come to reactants. This is the frequency dependent property of components such as capacitors and inductors. We have been taught that the inductive reactance is equal to two times pi times the frequency in Hertz times the inductance in Henry's. And that capacitor reactance is equal to one divided by two times pi times the frequency in Hertz times the capacitance in Farad's. Then they tell you that inductive reactance is positive and capacitive reactance is negative without telling you why this is. Just believe it because I told you this. 
Well, let me show you why this is by adding in the missing piece to these two equations. And you might say, well, what is missing? The answer is J, the impossible, inescapable number. To be totally and technically complete, the inductive reactance is equal to 2 times pi times the frequency in hertz times the inductance in henrys times J. And capacitive reactance is equal to 1 divided by 2 times pi times the frequency in hertz times the capacitance in farads times J. But we have a problem. The J is on the bottom of the equation for the capacitive reactance, and we never want to have J on the bottom. We always work to get all of the J stuff in the numerator. Well, how do we do this? If we multiplied this equation by 1, it would have the same value, right? 1 times anything is the same thing we started with. Well, what if I had the fraction 2 divided by 2? Well, 2 divided by 2 is 1 because anything divided by itself is 1, right? So, what if we had the fraction j over j? Well, j divided by j, well, it would be 1 because Anything divided by itself is still 1, even the impossible, inescapable j. With all of this in mind, let's fix our equation for capacitive reactance. Capacitive reactance is equal to our original equation, 1 divided by 2 times pi times f times c times j. That original equation multiplied by the fraction j over j. That gives us 1 times j on the top, and then 2 times pi times f times c times j times j on the bottom. Can you see what's going on in the denominator? We have a j times j going on. Well, j times j is minus 1, remember? And 1 times j, which is on the top, is equal to j. So. This all becomes the capacitive reactance is equal to J, all divided by 2 times pi times F times C times minus 1 in the bottom. And this gives us a minus J on the top, all divided by 2 times pi times F times C on the bottom. Now, if we pull the J out of the numerator, we get the final result of minus 1 on the top all divided by 2 times pi times f times c, all times j. Now you can see why we're told that capacitive reactance is negative. Now let's do one last thing to simplify what we have here even more. You know, in the electrical engineering world, we often think of frequency a little bit differently. We think in terms of radians per second as opposed to hertz or cycles per second. The symbol used for radians per second is the lowercase Greek letter omega. There are two pi radians in 360 degrees or one full cycle. So this whole business of two times pi times the frequency that we see in the bottom of the equation is very quickly replaced by the single letter omega. Thus, the final equation for capacitive reactance becomes minus 1 divided by omega times c on the bottom, all times j. And the same thing can also be applied to the inductive reactance formula so that we get the inductive reactance is equal to omega times the inductance in Henry's all times J. Where omega, like I said, is equal to 2 times pi times the frequency in hertz, or it is the frequency in radians per second. So, We've laid some foundations. We know about the impossible, inescapable number represented by the letter J. We also have the complete equation for inductive reactance as omega times L times J. 
and the complete equation for capacitive reactants, which is minus 1 divided by omega c, all times j. Now we get to see how we can visualize this reality. Impedance is a combination of a pure resistive element and a pure reactive element. It is represented by the capital letter Z. The purely resistive portion is represented by the letter R. The purely reactive or frequency dependent portion is represented by the capital letter X. This X is the composite value of all the combined capacitive and inductive reactances in our particular circuit. It is the numerical portion of the results of the equations that I've already been talking about. Impedance is expressed as impedance is equal to R plus XJ. This impedance reality is often plotted on what is called the Cartesian coordinate system. This Cartesian coordinate system has a horizontal axis, which in the math world is referred to as the x-axis. It also has a vertical axis at right angles to the horizontal axis, which in the math world is referred to as the y-axis. When we are talking about this whole impedance thing, we're going to reassign these axes. The horizontal axis becomes the real or purely resistive axis. The vertical axis becomes the imaginary or purely reactive axis. So, Let's plot an inductive impedance so that we can see how this works. Suppose that we had an impedance of 5 plus 4j. We place a dot on the horizontal or real axis or resistive axis at the 5. We draw a line vertically from this point. We place a dot on the positive vertical or imaginary axis at the 4 and then we draw a line horizontally from this point. We now place a dot at the place where these two lines cross. This last dot represents this impedance. Now we draw a line from the origin out to this last dot. This line is called a phasor, and this is a phasor diagram of this impedance. This line is also called a vector. Notice now that this line forms the hypotenuse of a right triangle. The length of this line is referred to as the magnitude of this impedance. Using the standard trigonometric formula for the length of a hypotenuse of a right triangle, this magnitude is found using this formula. The magnitude is equal to the square root of the sum of the resistance squared plus the reactance squared. In this case, we would have a magnitude of the square root of 5 squared plus 4 squared, which comes out to 6.403. Now, this line exists with a specific angle between itself and the horizontal axis. This angle is referred to as the phase of the impedance. Using the standard trigonometric formula for the inverse or arc tangent of an angle, this angle can be found using this formula. The phase is equal to the inverse tangent of the reactance divided by the resistance. So in our case, the phase of our impedance is equal to the inverse tangent of 4 divided by 5, which gives us an angle of 38.66 degrees. So our impedance of 5 plus 4j could also be written in terms of the phasor quantities as the impedance is equal to 6.403 at an angle of 38.66. Now, let's talk about series and parallel impedances. Series impedances are the simplest stuff to deal with because it's just addition and most of us can handle addition. The total impedance is equal to Z1 plus Z2 plus Z3 and so on and so forth. Now when we add two impedances together, we have to add their constituent parts individually. So if we have two impedances in series, Z1 and Z2, where Z1 is equal to R1 plus XJ1, 
and Z2 is equal to R2 plus XJ2. Then to find the total impedance, we add them in this way. The total impedance is equal to R1 plus R2 plus X1 plus X2 times J. Now, using an example with numbers, suppose we have these two impedances in series. We have Z1 is equal to 5 plus 4J, and Z2 is equal to 12 plus 2J. So then the total impedance would be 5 plus 12 plus 4 plus 2J, which would be 17 plus 6J. If we do this on our Cartesian coordinate system, it kind of looks like this. First of all, we plot the first impedance like we did before. So we put a dot at the 5 on the real axis. We put a dot at the 4 on the imaginary axis. And then we go out 12 steps further on the real axis and place our dot there. We draw our vertical line there. Then we go out two steps further on the imaginary axis, place our dot there, draw our line horizontally. Then we place a dot where these two lines cross, and there's our new impedance. Draw the line from the origin out to that final dot. Calculate the length of this line to get the magnitude of the impedance. That would give us a magnitude of 18.028 ohms. Observe the angle between the vector and the real axis. And then we can calculate this angle for the phase of the impedance. In this case, it gives us an angle of 19.44 degrees. So our resulting impedance is 18.028 with an angle of 19.44 degrees. Well, let's do one more example inv involving an inductive impedance and a capacitive impedance. So suppose we had the first impedance would be 6 plus 10J. Now this is inductive because the reactive portion is positive and it's in series with another impedance which is 9 minus 3J and it's capacitive because its reactive portion is negative. So the total impedance would be 6 plus 9 that's the real portions, plus we have 10 minus 3 times J. So that would give us a total impedance of 15 plus 7J. Now, doing this on a phasor diagram, we plot Z1 first. So we, we go out there and we stick a, a dot on the 10 on the, on the imaginary axis and a dot at the 6 on the real axis. And then we move nine more steps out on the real axis, and we place our dot there. We draw our vertical line. Then we go three more steps, but wait a second. The reactance for the second impedance is negative. So we don't go out three more steps. We go down three more steps and we put a dot on the reactive axis, we place our horizontal line, then we place our dot where those two lines cross, and then we draw our line out from the center, out to this final dot. The magnitude is the length of this line, or the square root of 15 squared plus 7 squared. That gives us 16.55 ohms. The phase of this new impedance is the inverse tangent of 7 divided by 15, or 25 degrees. Okay, so now what about parallel impedances? Well, parallel impedances are a bit more difficult. We should all be very familiar with the formula for N resistors in parallel, which is 1 divided by 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2 plus 1 over R3 and so on. Well, this same formula applies to impedances. What makes it tough is that impedance is a complex entity of the form R plus XJ. This leads us to some rather unpleasant math for many people. Now, I'm hopefully going to make this easier for you. 
As I said in another video, the bottom of this parallel resistor equation is the sum of the conductances of the resistors in parallel. Conductance is represented by the letter G and is found by dividing 1 by the resistance. So G, the conductance, is equal to 1 divided by R. So 1 over R1 is the conductance of R1, 1 over R2 is the conductance of R2, and so on. Admittance is to impedance what conductance is to pure resistance. Admittance is found by dividing 1 by the impedance, and it is represented by the letter Y. So Y, the admittance, is equal to 1 divided by Z, the impedance. It has the constituent parts of conductance and susceptance. Susceptance is the AC equivalent to conductance and is represented by the letter B. So admittance is expressed in the form of Y is equal to G plus B J. If we convert each of the impedances that are in parallel to admittance, then we can just simply add all the admittances together to get the total admittance of the circuit. Now, to make this easy, here are the CAN formulas for your convenience. If the impedance is equal to R plus XJ, and 1 over the impedance is equal to Y or G plus BJ, then the, the conductance is equal to the resistance R divided by the quantity, the resistance squared plus the reactance squared. And the susceptance B is equal to minus the reactance all divided by the resistance squared plus the reactance squared. Now, in the same way that we added the constituent parts of the impedances to get the total impedance, we add the constituent parts of the admittances to get the total admittance. So, let's do a quick example here. Suppose I have two impedances in parallel. The first is 0 0.02 plus 4J. Now, this is an inductor because the reactive portion is positive. So the conductance, G, is going to be equal to 0 0.02, all divided by that quantity, 0 0.02 squared plus 4 squared, which is going to equal 0.00125. And the susceptance, B, is equal to minus 4, all divided by that quantity again, 0 0.02 squared plus 4 squared, which comes out to be minus 0 0.25, which gives us an admittance Y of 0 0.00125 minus 0 0.25J. Now our second impedance is 0 0.01 minus 12J, and it's a capacitor because its reactive portion is negative. So the conductance G is going to be 0.01 divided by 0.01 squared plus 12 squared, which comes out to be 6.94444 many times 4 times 10 to the minus 5. And the susceptance B is equal to minus a minus 12, that comes out to be a plus 12, all over that same quantity, 0 0.01 squared plus 12 squared, and that equals 0 0.083333 many times 3, which gives us an admittance of 6.94444 times 10 to the minus 5 plus 0 0.083333j. To get the total admittance, we add these two admittances together. Again, we're adding the constituent parts, so we add the conductance parts together, which would be 0 0.00125 plus 6.9444 times 10 to the minus 5, plus the susceptance parts together, which would be, which would be minus 0.25 plus 0 0.08333, 
and then that's J at the end. So the total admittance would be 0 0.001319 minus 0 0.16666J. Now, we could plot these on the Cartesian coordinate system, just like we did with the series impedances. The horizontal axis becomes the conductance axis, and the vertical axis becomes the susceptance axis. We then could calculate the magnitude and phase of the admittance. And in this case, the magnitude comes out to 0.16666, and the phase of 89.55 degrees. To get the final impedance of this parallel combination, we have to convert the admittance to impedance. Now, we could divide the admittance into one, or we could use the following very familiar looking formulas. The resistance R is going to equal the conductance G divided by the conductance squared plus the susceptance squared. And the reactance is minus the susceptance divided by the conductance squared plus the susceptance squared, where G and B are the total conductance and the total susceptance of the circuit. So using these formulas, I get a resistance of 0.0475 and a reactance of plus 6.0. So the total impedance turns out to be 0.0475 plus 6J. Well, hopefully this has helped you get a better handle on impedances, capacitive and inductive reactances, phasers, the magnitude and phase of impedances, and series and parallel impedances. If you found this video helpful, please click on the like and don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Thank you so much for watching. Until next time, toodaloots.